Welcome to The O Show. I'm Laura Babcock. And as you know, we've been spending a lot of time talking about affordable housing, talking about homelessness, talking about the entire housing continuum and how it's impacting municipalities right across Ontario. Well, one of our O Show producers said, you know, Laura, you've got to talk to somebody who can give us sort of more context, more background, even more information on exactly how housing policy works and why it's so important. And so I'm so pleased to have, I think, joining us for the first time on the O Show, Maureen. Is that true? Is this your first time? That's funny. <laughs> Welcome to the O Show, Maureen Wilson. She is a counselor in the city of Hamilton. And Maureen, before we get into the whole parking over people and the Stony Creek controversy and all that stuff, and the mayor's history historic veto, which I heard about actually from clients in Kitchener-Waterloo this morning, so everyone's paying attention. Hamilton, as I've often said, is often on the tip of the spear of many issues related to social and economic justice and now housing as well, um, which fits into all of that. So, you know, a lot of people are paying attention, but you also put out a, a tweet that was quite provocative, where you said that the Ford government's spring budget was a danger to the future of the Ontario economy. And I'd love for you to just unpack that for us a little bit uh, before we get into some of these other issues that I want to speak to you about, including, by the way, uh, the changes to the environmental policies in the province. So what did you mean by that it's a danger to the future of the Ontario economy? Sure. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, as goes housing, so goes the economy. Uh, we know the precariousness of housing is working its way up the income ladder, yes. uh, you know, from beyond very low income individuals, persons uh, who have an intersection, say, of disability, LGBTQ, um, to nurses and teachers and uh, individuals who are working the EMS profession, mm -hmm. uh, they cannot afford to get into the private housing market. Uh, they don't qualify for public housing. And so many are living uh, in what I call a, a tenure cliff of housing. They're living in, uh, if they can't afford housing here in Hamilton, they're living in units uh, that no longer meet their needs. Um, they can't move out of their units because there's nothing uh, available to them to move into. And that causes a whole uh, uh, a, a, a ripple effect in that those units are are, are uh, being uh, dwell, they're, they're living in units that they could move out of. And that is creating a ripple uh, effect of houselessness. So my my argument, and it's not just mine, it's uh, it's well known, is that we are losing um, educated, talented, skilled uh, workers to other areas of Canada in which the housing supply is more ample. Ford, I would argue, has always, uh, he's kind of boxed himself in by the ideologues that he has surrounded himself in, in that he cannot seem to put himself in the direction that a place like British Columbia is going, which clearly understands that housing supply and letting also a market decide on um, fourplexes, housing plexes to provide the kind of private supply that uh, young graduates and other workers can move into. So that's why it's absolutely a clear and present danger to our economy. Wow. So, you know, uh, th there's a lot. <laughs> I knew talking to you, there'd be a lot to unpack with everything you say, but let's just start with a couple of things there. I mean, first of all, I 100% take your point. I think that um, you talk about that 10-year housing cliff, if that's the language you use. Uh, mm -hmm. That's very powerful because in the last six months, and I'm slow to this, uh, Maureen, but I've been learning that, you know, there are people who are nurses who are living in encampments in Hamilton, right? So, to your to your point like the 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 housing precariousness or precarity is reaching people in income levels that we wouldn't have expected it's not simply this old stereotype that it's you know 30 year olds who have made bad decisions and are doing too many drugs certainly 
as we saw in Steve Pakin's article, which I want to speak to you about in a moment, about the tenth city he called it, or TBO called it yesterday at Hamilton City Hall. Um, yeah. Certainly, there is tremendous amounts of of drug use, and we are in a poisoning drug poisoning crisis. There's all kinds of dangerous stuff into the drug supply that's killing people and putting them at great harm. It's terrible out there, especially if you've got kids or teenagers. It's terrifying. Um, but people who are living in homelessness, experiencing homelessness, are often also uh, experiencing that crisis. Of, of drug poisoning. And I've said many times, if I had to live three nights on cold concrete, <laughs> you know, in downtown Hamilton, I, I'd be looking for some way to stay alert, get through the night, get through the pain. I mean, so so, there, so there's, we're, we're dealing with all these kind of different crises, but I think it's important for people to realize that there are people like in the story that Steve Pakin told, a woman who was, was in an apartment, got rent evicted, got 500 bucks from her landlord, ended up uh, you know, couch surfing in people's houses, which is not considered yet homelessness. It's this kind of mm -hmm. place that we don't track the stats on um, and then end up, you know, uh, on actually going to an encampment when they run out of money at the motel that they were trying to stay in. And then they're in a dangerous situation in an encampment. And then they find another encampment that seems safer, like in her case, the one at City Hall. Um, but it is it's heartbreaking to hear these stories and the spectator profile, the gentleman as well, had jobs. I speak to people every weekend, had jobs, had apartments, got rent evicted. So, so that, that one point around, you know, the fact that we are, there are many people who are in precarious housing, uh, not like in the past that, you know, some people are waking up to that, I think. But also when you talk about this 10 year cliff, I mean, if we're not putting stock into the housing at all the levels along the continuum, from emergency need shelter beds to transitional mm -hmm. supportive housing to accessible affordable housing to on and on we go, um, we're also, and this is what I hadn't thought of, Maureen, really, until you brought it up, we're also impacting the, the potential to retain and recruit talent in this province, to create the kind of uh, communities that we wanna have where we are able to keep our children working. I mean, so so can you expand on maybe some of that? And if you wanna weigh in right away to what uh, Pakin said, cause he kind of called out council, the decision makers and said, you have to be, I think the quote was a hell of a lot more creative if the people in front of city hall are gonna have hope of, of accessing housing. So take it wherever you want, Maureen. <laughs> Yeah, well, to use your phrase, there's a lot to unpack there. But first, let me just say um, uh, our economy uh, is built on the care economy. Mm. Um, a lot of people wouldn't be able to go to work full time in the absence of childcare workers. A lot of people wouldn't be able to age in their home in the, abs in the absence of personal support workers. And in so doing, enable that emergency bed, that hospital bed to be freed up. We... Uh, we have a, a, a lot riding on the care economy. We don't pay the care economy and the people are in it. And most of them are uh, identified as, as female. So those are there's no accidents there. But I guess the other thing I would say is um, when, you're, when you talk about the real issues of, of substance abuse mm -hmm. um, and acuity of needs uh, and mental health, uh, I would like us to remain on topic respectfully in that house houselessness is a housing crisis. First and foremost, if we can focus on housing, and that is the principle of housing first, uh, because when we bring in all of these other elements, and I, I heard it during the encampment debates, uh, they, there was a, a willingness in which to apply judgment a great willingness in which to apply judgment about uh, people who uh, uh, had substance needs and uses. Yeah. And yeah. we tended to use that uh, as an excuse for why they're homeless. Uh, it, it does exacerbate, it does challenge the, the ability and the capacity to get appropriate housing. But first and foremost, yeah. homelessness is a housing crisis. And that's where uh, I would like to to focus, and that's where I try and focus much of uh, my engagement, at least with Ward 1 residents. Well, I mean, it, uh, how, what we choose to focus on, I, I hope, is just what is going to work. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So my, my dog in the hunt is to get people off the streets and into housing and get it so that seniors can, you know, maybe uh, downsize from their houses to provide more housing stock for families. Yep. 
but can find somewhere else that they can live. I had this conversation with my neighbor who's a senior on a fixed income last night. You know, even mm -hmm. if you were able to sell, where do you go? Because the housing That's market right. is so insane. So, I mean, for, for me, where my focus is, is what is going to get people in our society to be getting Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, shelter, right? <laughs> Food, the, the things that, you know, the things that we need to self-actualize. It, it, it feels as though the bottom is dropping out. And, and that is the, you know, if you can't, if you're working at shifts or if you're in the care economy, to your point, uh, and you can't get shelter, you, and I had on the uh, CEO of Wesley recently, and his comment uh, still strikes me where he said that, uh, you know, ha he has his own experiences and he was talking about, you know, when people can't get a bed to sleep in at night or a good night's sleep how do they face the rest of the day rest is mm -hmm. incredibly important so I, I look at it and this is just my lens maureen but i look at it as being um there is we are all seeing with our own eyes an increasingness of people living in precarious housing living without housing we're seeing like it's in every city it's across canada i was just reading how the city of seattle um, declared a homeless emergency a number of years ago, put a bunch of money into it. Now they've moved it up to a regional lens because it's such a huge problem. They've got all these tracking and I applaud you actually, because you track, you track these numbers and publish them in your newsletter. You're not kind of hiding from the problem. Like I think some people want to on council. Um, you're very, you're, you know, it is what it is. So I take your point that if we don't have housing, there, I mean, we have to have the housing. However people get into housing at whatever point with whatever supports, if it doesn't exist along the continuum, we're all kind of screwed. Right? I mean, I, that, yeah, yeah for sure. There, but. <laughs> well, it's hard to stay in school when, right. if you don't have a safe, predictable place in which to live, yeah. right? It's hard to hold a job. Um, uh, it, it's hard to care for others. Um, and all during the day, uh, only to end your day without a place to go. Um, so yeah, those are absolute can reality. Can you imagine? I mean, I know that we're both people of privilege, of course. Um, yep. But I, I, I think about it now all the time. Like, however bad my day is, whatever stress I've had, mm. you know, raising teenagers as you've done, I mean, you get it. Um, I know that I at least can crash on the couch and chill, or I can at least, you know, sit in the backyard and have a glass. I, can, there, I have somewhere where I can be safe and warm, and I can't imagine what that feels like otherwise. And so I think it's, it's so it's not just, there are still people who are in their housing and their rental. And I want to talk about the rental policy the city came up with. There are people who are still currently renting, but living in tremendous fear, Maureen, of rent eviction of of losing that of the, and so they feel like they're holding on to their housing with you know with everything in them and which is not a good way to live i mean it, it's it's somewhat predictable post pandemic but you know pox on all the houses of government at all levels for not anticipating the need for a housing supply at this stage um but i mean so what do you so can you explain the city's rental policy like is there is there assurances? I know Trudeau came out with a renter thing the other day that got some backlash because it didn't. It seemed to be more a little more talk than action. But the city did something, right? Can you can you explain where the city is with helping renters? Well, there is a, a series of, of measures uh, that were passed, it, largely informed by uh, the direct experience uh, of tenants uh, through Acorn Hamilton, who have been tr doing tremendous advocacy and education and capacity building. Yeah. Um, so hats off to them. Uh, but the, I think the whole intent is uh, to, to value rental units mm -hmm. and by extension, value the people who are living in them. Mm -hmm. uh, and then to ensure that uh, they are physically uh, sound places to live that we don't enable the market to allow them to deteriorate to the point where the individual um, is having to move somewhere else, is enticed to leave in order for um, renovations to uh, occur. Uh, and, uh, we, and as a consequence, we lose an affordable unit. And in the last 10 years, I believe Hamilton has lost uh, 16,000 wow. affordable units, which are defined as $750 a month or less. And um, so it is to try and value rental uh, uh, 
living, value renters, try and secure from a property uh, standard perspective to ensure that the renovations that are having to be done, because we, we do need investment in those buildings, uh, that uh, we have, for example, a building inspector come in uh, to uh, ensure that, yes, in fact, <clears throat> the renovations that have to be done here or the investments that have to be done here are uh, to are going to be so intrusive and so significant that for a period of time, the tenant has to move out. And then there are other conditions that they have the right uh, to move back in and other uh, a place must be found. But <clears throat> it starts from that. We, we have to secure the units that we have now as a consequence of those 16,000 that we have last lost over the last decade or so. So, uh, so that's a staggering number. You know, it's so, mm. uh, it's so frustrating, right? So, I want to get into uh, the the impetus for affordable housing and some of the considerations around how we den like you know how we aggregate it and stuff like that. But before I did, I did float out the Steve Pakin analysis of what he saw and his criticism of City Hall. Um, let me ask you this: I mean, he's talking about a need for creative thinking or creative solutions, and do you, in your assessment, feel as though um, council? It sounds like with some of this rental stuff, you know, you're you're looking at it and saying we've got to we've got to come up with some measures here. Do you think that council has been creative enough in terms of solutions? Because I'm always of the two minds, uh, Maureen. I'll be honest with you. Like, I mean, when I read the Seattle strategy, they they incorporate everything from how they um, move encampments, people from encampments into beds, to their affordable housing stock that they're building, to, I mean, like they put the entire thing on a continuum with metrics and with, you know, with trends, uh, you know, very, very clear about where they are with all of them. So that's why I sort of see it. So part of me thinks, why not just use best practices from other places? There's lots of places around North America and the world that are dealing with these very same issues that we are. Um, so, you know, copy best practice, but there's also to Pakin's point, is is there enough creativity around the table? Do you feel as though this term of council is looking at these things and bringing to bear, you know, the expertise of someone like the JP, who's an engineer, and someone with your different background, and like all the different experiences and backgrounds and assets that are around the council this term? Well, listen, this is a this is a crisis, yeah. and um, council unanimously last year declared that crisis. When things are a crisis, you're not going to change it unless you do things differently. If if we're anticipating or we're expecting uh, different outcomes, if you're not prepared to pull your levers and to do things differently, you, you're not going to be able to address that crisis. Um, so that's one thing. And I, I think uh, there's always going to be room for improvement. There's always going to be room for creativity. I guess I would step back, though, and say um, what we have been told, and as a consequence, again, council unanimously supported an action plan. It's called as HSIR, the Housing Sustainability and Investment Roadmap. Um, in that, there, there is a, a continuum of housing, and there are um, an acknowledged number of actions that can be taken more readily, uh, low barrier, more affordable in terms of a public investment, uh, an already uh, a surplus parking lot being one of them that's already zoned uh, for housing uh, that is already owned by the city. That's a, that's a no brainer. That's an example of an action that this council agreed. Right, mm -hmm. we need to do. We need to move in that direction. Um, so that's why some of us are quite befuddled. Um, at the unwillingness in which to lean into the commitment that we we gave. Um, but in the city of Hamilton, what we have also discovered is we actually, um, in terms of our investments, we have invested quite a bit into emergency housing, mm -hmm. but we have to gradually, what we're hoping that the action plan will enable us in partnership with the provincial and federal governments and all of community, including our awesome not-for-profit housing providers, is that we make that gradual shift from emergency housing shelters to uh, um, affordable, supportive uh, units because nobody wants to stay in emergency shelters. Yeah, um, yeah. And it's not, that's not housing. It is, as the word suggests, 
emergency. Um, but we have to make that gradual shift. We can't do it quickly because we're talking about human beings. Right. We're talking about families. Um, we're talking about some refugees. We're talking about people who uh, with some degrees of vulnerabilities, but we have to make that gradual shift. And so declare a crisis, uh, unanimously support an action plan, take the take the easy early wins, let's get on with it. Um, and, and it may not be creative, but at least it's action. Well, it's one of the reasons why I pushed so hard for um, the resolution at council that came the other day. And I'm glad that the mayor, Andrea Horvath, pulled the lever, uh, the strong mayor power lever that she had to get that done. And you support her veto as well. Um, and, you know, I, I hoped it wouldn't come to that. I hoped that the other councillors across the table would realize that when you set strategic priorities, the plan is that when decisions come up, you align with those strategic priority setting. Otherwise, what's the point of having them, right? So this idea, as you said, I think your word was befuddled, a little befuddled. That's a nice way of saying, what the hell are you doing? This is what you said was an urgent priority. Uh, and mm -hmm. now when the decision comes up, you decide, well, no, not there. Not, no, not there because of X, Y, and Z. So, I mean, for myself, I can't speak for others, but I was pushing very hard on this vote that council had, and I'm glad that Andrea pulled the lever on the veto, was because if they didn't go ahead with it after saying it was a strategic priority, Maureen, what would stop that from happening every single time that the housing secretariat or that council was presented with an opportunity to build affordable housing uh, because i mean that, that didn't trudeau just say you know there's a billion dollars coming jump in line get in queue with projects municipalities let's rock and roll i mean the mm -hmm. idea that we as a community would make that a strategic priority declare that it's a crisis and then play around with the details on something um to me i was deeply concerned about the signal that that would send to other levels of government that we weren't in fact serious and to put the money elsewhere and yep. i was deeply concerned about the message it would send to people who are all along the spectrum uh who it, it would feel no sense of hope that was a deep concern mm -hmm. but also i was concerned about every other nimby group and every other ward that was going to say well they could fight it in stony creek if we cause enough noise uh we can fight it as well and i told tom jackson you know if you try that on the in my in our ward i'm in his ward i'll be on the front lines of that fight too i mean so so what how do you assess the fact that there was a strategic priority and then we had to fight so vociferously and to the point of an encampment protest in front of city hall and uh, Andrea pulling this this lever of a strong mayor powers. Yeah, so uh, what I, I tried to say in my re remarks um, at council and to the residents of Ward 1 so that I can be held publicly accountable for my position is <clears throat> to try and put this into some context. And the context for me is always historic. Mm -hmm. And um, housing has always been subject to, to bias. Mm -hmm. um, we, we have a history of segregating people by race and by income. Mm -hmm. And housing policy has been used to, to allow for that segregation intentionally. So in my remarks, I was saying um, prior to the 1950s, it, what we had uh, things called restrictive covenants. And uh, they were uh, deeds on lands that said, if, if you are a Jew, uh, if you're Armenian, if you're from Southern um, Europe, you, you are not allowed to buy this house and to live on this property. And that was ch challenged. Uh, legally in the courts. It took four or five years until the Supreme Court ruled and the, the Premier of Ontario, I think in 1950, eventually ruled. My purpose in telling that story is that we have always used housing uh, as a way in which to segregate. Uh, when those racially um, motivated riders were legally challenged and may, deemed illegal thereafter, we, but we have always used different ways in which to segregate by income. Um, it, it, we have uh, in Westdale, for example, where they did have restrictive covenants in Ward 1, uh, we used um, uh, mandated uh, materials. So the buildings had to be made out of brick. And in so doing, uh, the buildings were 
priced accordingly and therefore put out of reach for some people. We've used minimum building lots. Uh, it used to be uh, lots were auctioned off, uh, but that was found anybody could respond to an auction. And that's why the real estate industry was created in which to allow uh, more control over who was able to move into uh, a residential neighborhood. So I wanted to put it in that context of um, we have segregated in Hamilton very visibly. We can see it on maps by income. Um, and I found it interesting, therefore, uh, the debate. Um, and we have always used code words in which to try and uh, enable us publicly uh, to allow for segregation. So in Stony Creek, it became one of uh, it parking. Um, but I, I found it interesting in the remarks following uh, the mayor's use of the veto that members of council were saying, well, if this can happen here, it can happen to you. And uh, we're going to put, be putting affordable housing in Ancaster, we're going to force affordable housing in Waterdown, to which my question is, wait a minute, I thought it was about parking. Yeah. And so we, we're weaponizing it and using uh, affordable housing as uh, the threat of it, as being something that will threat the pose a threat to the integrity of our, our neighborhoods. Whereas I was hoping that we are at a point in this crisis where we would see the humanity and the value of every individual, and that we know even from an ecological point of view that mixed income neighborhoods mix. When we mix things, it is um, much more positive, much more sustainable, much more resilient. Um, and so uh, that's also part of intentional planning um, and uh, looking for intentional outcomes. I hadn't really realized until the Stony Creek debate, to be frank with you, that how much housing policy is social policy. How oh, much? Yeah. I hadn't really realized it, to be honest. And when you talk about the integrity of the neighborhood, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you're not talking about the architectural integrity of the neighborhood. It's not like mixing a 70s style with a, you know, whatever style. It's about the people, you know, and mm -hmm. some of the stuff coming out of the Stony Creek debate felt very much like it was about saying we don't want those kind of people. And those are direct comments that I was getting about, you know, what are we going to do with the crime once affordable housing and all this kind of stuff, right? And so, what we, is, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, but we also heard this same thing in the in the in the uh, the premier's remarks. Mm. It, it 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 is an extension of the same argument, right? Mm. When the premier was in Hamilton, uh, in which he um, um, made uh, the 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 comment that the province was not going to mandate fourplexes, even though we're in a housing crisis, even though we have uh, people uh, stuck in private tenant on the tenancy cliff. Yeah. Um, his choice of words were something like, well, uh, th these fourplexes could come to Waterdown, to Ancaster, to Dundas. That wasn't an accident. Right. He chose those places intentionally. Mm -hmm. um, and what the subtext, of course, is that uh, people uh, who can't afford to uh, monster homes or can't afford perhaps to live in those neighborhoods might have the opportunity to, to do so when we allow for a diverse housing stock. You know, it's interesting because I, I was on a panel in Toronto with John Tory, the former mayor, talking about the the fourplexes issue with Ford. Mm. <laughs> and I know Ford listens to the to that conversation on the, that panel often. And I was I was I was kind of impressed by Mayor Tory because given his his leanings on different things, I thought, you know, where is he going to go with this? And he said to me, you know, Laura, when he was mayor and people opposed fourplexes in their neighborhoods because they thought it would, you know, threaten the, in, the integrity of the neighborhood, he would bring them to the street and say, point out the fourplexes, you know, and they were unable to. And so he used it as a way of saying, you know, you're, the fears around this kind of mixed use housing are, are that, right? I don't want to paraphrase what John said, but I thought it was a, it was a good practical way of saying uh, so much of this is fear mongering. The, the premier is fear mongering, you know, and we saw from members of council when I think it was Matt Francis, and I could be wrong, Maureen, uh, 
apologies, Matt, if I'm wrong, but I think he was quoted in The Spectator, I believe, saying it could come to your neighborhood, right? As though there's some sort of a, a threat at the door, at the gate of having, I, I live across, as you, you've been to my house, you know, I live across from a huge Hamilton public housing complex. I love my neighborhood, <laughs> you know, it's a great neighborhood. Uh, it's exciting and interesting and diverse, but that's what makes it wonderful. Uh, and so, you know, this idea that somehow this is going to ruin the quality and the character of neighborhoods by having other people be able to ac access housing. You're right, it, it lacks humanity. Uh, and, and it's terrible to hear from the Premier, and I don't like to hear it around the council table. Let me ask you about this made in Stony Creek solution, this idea that when they lost the vote because of the veto, some councillors said, okay, well, now we're going to find alternatives now that we've lost. I mean, mm -hmm. I wish they'd been doing that all along. And hell, if they can come up with 50 other locations across Hamilton, yay, you're doing the work of the Secretariat, you're helping them. You know, more the better in my mind. But but yeah. my concern was when I saw it around Riverdale. I mean, isn't there something in your historical context, not just about how these housing policy decisions were meant to exclude and to and to you know push marginalized people further to the margins, but aren't they also don't don't isn't there a risk of creating a kind of a ghettoization, a kind of a you know putting um, people into one area where there isn't that opportunity for that that kind of mixed use diversity that you spoke of? Yeah, well, that's what we've done. I mean, um, uh, uh, when when you when you have a a, a reliable income mm -hmm. uh, that enables you to look beyond just uh, you know paying your rent, uh, that it 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 enables you to engage um, in things that are that matter to you. Um, and so what what we have done is we have necessarily it's not an accident. Um, there's no neutrality in space, right? Um, we have uh, created a, a city that has uh, allowed intentionally for concentrated poverty. And so it just creates a, a, a vicious cycle. Um, and when you deplete, uh, when you concentrate poverty, uh, then you have people, I think you use the phrase hierarchy of, of needs. You have people just uh, busy trying to survive. They don't have the, the time to come out and, and delegate um, to, at City Hall and oppose housing projects. Um, and so it is the path of least political resistance to just build more of the same. Mm -hmm. And um, Riverdale, uh, we know, has a lower income index of about 20%. Uh, some people have called it Hamilton's uh, arrival city. We, we know that it has a wonderful, rich, uh, diverse uh, uh, residents that uh, come to Canada. They're new Canadians. Um, but are do they have the time, resources, language in which to, uh, are, and are they uh, encouraged? Are we putting public meetings in Riverdale to talk with them about, um, you know, what best suits their needs? So when we are putting in housing and often, Again, because we deem affordable housing to be uh, a, a threat or a, something that will take away from the integrity of your neighborhood, uh, the easiest thing politically has been to just follow the path of least resistance and just keep putting it in the same and the same and the same place. And the argument that I uh, tried to make, probably not so eloquently, is that we, um, we know that mixed income neighborhoods provide the best pathway for children eventually to work their way, get their way out of poverty. Why is that? Because mixed income neighborhoods uh, mean mixed income classrooms. Mm. Yes, and that's incredibly important. <laughs> you know, I could just I think about the richness my kids experience by being in such a diverse income, diverse yeah. as well uh, environment. Um, so, just a couple of last quick things while I have you here, more. Yeah. Um, one is just on the I want to get to the back to the provincial thing you because I know you're deeply concerned also about environmental policy provincially, and I don't want to give you miss yeah. any because we have a provincial audience with this program now, so I want to make sure you can weigh in on that. But there was a suggestion made by uh, a publication uh, locally that you know because of this contentious vote at uh, around this affordable housing and the veto usage that the battle lines are drawn and this council will be forever locked in this and your two council colleagues uh, Councillor Alex Wilson and Cameron Kretsch 
push back against that narrative quite strongly on the show. I don't know if you saw the show earlier this week, but they, they said, you know, no, we actually agree on more things as a council than people realize. And we're not, they don't, they don't subscribe to that narrative that, you know, all is lost and we're back in this kind of locked in, you know, uh, council that can't agree or get things done. Where, where do you stand with how council proceeds following um, really the fallout of this vote and the fact that you've now got these councillors over here doing this and that and the other thing. Where do you think council goes from here? Well, I guess you have to always ask yourself, why are you there? Mm. Um, you know, we're there because uh, I'll speak for myself. Mm -hmm. um, I'm there because I, I love this city. I believe in its potential. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's hard to get things done uh, if you personalize things. And it's hard to get things done if you don't work together. Um, and sometimes the alliance of uh, what you agree on, it may shift. Sometimes it doesn't because there's just some ba basic core values of what you believe are the uh, ingredients to fundamental uh, city building. Uh, but you have to allow for those shifting alliances depending on the subject. Uh, but Hamilton, as I often say, is, is worth our best efforts. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have to look for those areas in which we agree because of that fundamental commitment to the city. I love that line. I'd heard you, I'd heard the line that you gave a couple of years ago that Hamilton was managing our decline, which has mm. resonated with me. And I think we've seen a lot too much evidence of that, um, but yeah. worth, worth our best efforts. I like that a lot. Uh, can you just, so, so you're saying hope springs, hope springs <laughs> that alliances can shift. Um, can you just address uh, about what your concern is with the environmental policy? Because are, are you on the board of the Hamilton Conservation Authority such as it still exists? And I am. And what is what is going on? Because I know that uh, a lot of our viewers across Ontario care deeply about Hamilton as the tip of the spear on the Greenbelt fight and the urban boundary um, uh, uh, protecting from or from mm -hmm. sprawl. So, so where what are your concerns, Maureen? Well, um, the premier has rightfully acknowledged that this province and uh, is in a housing crisis, and we do not have enough supply, mm -hmm. um, but he has used um, many excuses in which to try and uh, address that supply. And I would say that he has been grossly informed, misinformed rather in so doing. So under the pretense of getting uh, supply on the market, he has looked to conservation authorities and he has curtailed their ability to comment on development applications um, under the pretense that conservation authorities are getting in the way of the, the housing supply. And that's not true. Um, as you know, conservation authorities were created in which to ensure that we didn't put people and homes and buildings at risk. Don't build in a floodplain. Um, and as we have uh, grown uh, more informed about the importance of our urban waterways, uh, that knowledge has translated into us being able to comment on, you know, where to build, not to build near a wetland, what are the importance of wetlands. And so uh, what Ford has done, as I tried to explain the Friday before the family long weekend, he brought in a number of regulations which uh, curtail the capacity of uh, conservation authorities to comment on development permits. He has removed uh, the definition, uh, the word pollution in the regulations so that we cannot consider say uh, uh, development and the outflow uh, coming into our urban creeks. He has um, redefined what a, an, what a waterway is, uh, which again, um, disables our capacity to recognize that there's a whole bunch of very rich and important waterways that we need to protect uh, for our future. And he has also uh, limited uh, the scope of uh, what de conservation authorities can consider uh, on development permits. So uh, you, you it, it was 120 meters from provincially uh, significant wetlands you could not build within 120 meters and uh, conservation authorities had an obligation to comment and assess what that building might do. He's pushed it to 30 meters. 
So in combination, these things uh, present, uh, in my opinion, uh, a risk uh, to our waters and to our wetlands. Which is staggering when you see the chart that came out today about the depletion of our trees because of the last forest fire season in Canada and how it's already starting early and, and our air quality and the idea that we are messing with our wetlands, our watershed on any level uh, as madness, you know, uh, just, I mean, I know I'm oversimplifying it. I'm not an environmental scientist, but it just- Nor am I. <laughs> Well, yeah, but you always you're always well researched. Sounds so counterintuitive. You know, as I've been listening to you, Maureen, I've been thinking back to the first time I heard you weigh in on in media, I think was the Graham Crawford show way back in the day, his podcast. Oh, yeah. And I can't believe it's taken me so long to get you on the O show. Um, but you brought it like I thought you would uh, an informative conversation around some of the both the historical context, but also the um, the ramifications for economic and social justice and for the future of our economy that is tied into this housing discussion. Uh, and I, I'm so glad that you did. And that's why I wanted to have you on because when I saw your remarks at council and you took the time, uh, which you don't often do, you're not sort of a grandstanding <laughs> soapboxer. Uh, you took the time to really help people understand all of the implications of these decisions around affordable housing uh, in Hamilton um, and from the environmental to social justice to all of it. And so I hope it gives people the opportunity and possibly even some of your colleagues to take a pause and say, you know what? Um, this is bigger than some horse trade around this project or protecting this thing or catering to this voter base or whatever. There, there are massive ramifications and that, that idea of the 10 year cliff is, is frankly terrifying. Um, but I, I think that uh, I applaud council for what they've done around rent and for the mayor for what she's done on the veto with affordable housing and for you trying to expand our thinking around what can be a very you know, territorial, contentious kind of political battle to um, what we're really doing. And as you said, and I, I'll leave it on this unless you have anything else you'd like to add, you know, Hamilton is worth our best efforts. And sometimes our best efforts are not these battles that we fight so well in this city. Our best efforts are looking at the, the much, much bigger implications of, of these housing policies. Is there anything you wanna leave with our OSHO audience before we go? Uh, any thoughts or questions that I didn't bring to you today, Marie? No, thank you for the opportunity. Um, Council approved the creation of the Housing Secretariat because of the historic uh, politicization mm. of of housing mm. and where and what site of, and where affordable housing should go. Mm. No city councillor should be able to exact a veto on housing and particularly affordable housing. So the Secretariat was created to take that decision making and that gatekeeping okay. out of the hands of elected people and put it into professional staff. It doesn't mean that we're not democratically um, uh, responsible. That's why we create policy. And this council unanimously declared a housing crisis. This council unanimously uh, lent its support to an action plan. You. Uh, the public gets frustrated when uh, the actions do not match the words. 100%, 100%, especially when we see the precarious nature of the housing of so many people that we care about around us. Thank you so much, Maureen. Uh, all the best to you and yours. And thank you for watching the O Show and subscribing. Uh, we didn't plan on three shows this week, but it just so happened we needed to. Uh, so I'm not sure when I'll do another one, but thank you so much for watching the O Show and uh, we'll keep bringing you the great content and take very good care of yourselves. And one term that Maureen didn't bring up, but I think you brought up in your comments at Council, Maureen, was poverty by postal code. Um, yes which is I was telling someone about the difference in life expectancies between one postal code in Hamilton, which is like somewhere under 40 years old compared to, you know, the average for Canadians, which is like 70 to 80 or something. Uh, it's it was shocking. And, and oh, I, yeah, I could talk about this for a long time. It's gotten worse. So we do have poverty by postal code. Uh, yeah. We have a 23 year life expectancy uh, difference between the richest postal code in Hamilton and the poorest. That is not by accident. It is a consequence of concentrating poverty. Well, let's learn from that because that's horrific.
23 mm -hmm. years, all of us do so much to stay, to project a longer life, all our medical appointments, all of our eating, all of our exercise, hoping that we'll get somewhere near what's the standard. And imagine going through life knowing you have 23 years less to fight for because of where you happen to live. I think that's disgusting. Um, so let's, let's make sure we do better going forward. Thank you so much, Maureen Wilson, for being on The O Show. Thank you. When you care about current affairs, it's on The O Show. And when you want to get clear what's going on here, it's on the old show. If you like to stay in the know, tune yourself in to the old show. It's the old show. Laura Babcock's the old show. With a lot of great guests, she puts them to the test on the old show. There's no doubt they'll be calling them out on the old show. Stand for something or fall for it all. Ontario, hear the call on the old show. Podcast, the O Show. Laura Babcock, the O Show. Stay informed with the O Show, O Show.